consequentials. So it's only with independence that we have the chance to create the fairer and more equitable country that we seek. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward uh, the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. The Bank of England Governor Mark Carney said yesterday that he has no say in there being a currency union if there is a yes vote. But he did say if there was one, we would need shared institutions, shared mechanisms and tight fiscal rules. We would cede sovereignty. That would mean... Order. Order. They obviously didn't listen to what he said. <laughs> but that, of course, is par for the course. Don't listen to anybody who's saying anything that might make you be challenged. That would mean an independent Scotland would have to share mortgage rates, tax rates and a banking system and, and have our spending, borrowing and welfare decided by a foreign country we had just <laughs> left. In that respect, can I pass on my gratitude to John Swinney, wish him all the best in his next role and ask the First Minister whom he would prefer as his replacement, Ed Balls or George Osborne? <laughs> First Minister. I, I, I don't know Order. how I can break the news to Joanne Lamont. We, we don't control the currency or interest rates at the present moment. Uh, and George Osborne doesn't control interest rates because they are controlled by the independently operating Bank of England. That control was ceded some time ago. Uh, so, they, yes, of course, being in a a, a, a currency union means you don't control the currency, you don't control interest rates. We don't control these things at the present moment. And the list of other things that Joanne Lamont uh, went into, we don't control these either. They're controlled uh, in London. Now, can I say to Joanne Lamont some of the things uh, that we shall control as an independent Scotland? And she'll find them in page uh, 46 of the Economic Leavers report published last year. Uh, excise duty, air passenger duty, value-added tax, capital gains tax, oil and gas taxation, oh. national insurance, income tax, corporation tax, competition law, consumer protection, industry regulation, employment legislation and the minimum wage, hugely important, energy markets and regulation, environmental regulations, all things that are controlled in London at the present moment and all things that will be controlled in Scotland in an independent yeah. Scotland. Yeah. I fear the First Minister thinks all of this questioning is just another ridiculous frippery that he doesn't have to deal with. The rest of us are in the real world. I had thought the First Minister said that the reason we want independence is because all decisions about Scotland should be made in Scotland. It turns out he doesn't mind that all of these things are going to be decided elsewhere. Because Mark Carney said two other things yesterday. One was that he reported to the UK Parliament, a Parliament from which Alex Salmond proposes to remove all Scottish representation. And Mark Carney also said the decision on a currency union was won entirely for politicians. Considering George Osborne has said a currency union is highly unlikely, Ed Balls has said it's highly unlikely, and yesterday the Treasury said it was highly unlikely, what is the First Minister's plan B if a currency union fails? Ah. First Minister. Well, yeah, can I say to Jan Lamont that, that sterling is as much the people of Scotland's currency yeah. as it is a London's currency? Uh, and the Bank of England is one of the assets of the United Kingdom to which Scotland is entitled to a share. That is the shared governor's proposals that were put forward by the Scottish Government. Now, I led uh, Joanne Lamont uh, a long list of things an independent Scotland would control. And I, I think those are really important things. See, I think it's important to be able to set a minimum wage that keeps pace with inflation, as opposed to allowing it to reduce over the Order. last five years. I think it's important, instead of looking for ways Order. to mitigate the bedroom tax, why don't we have the power to abolish yeah. the bedroom tax? I think it's important to be able to transform childcare in this country, yeah. to get the revenues yeah. 
from that transformation into Scotland so as we can finance it. I think it's important to be able to abolish weapons of mass destruction in Scotland. I think it's important not to have to participate in illegal wars. These are the things we can do with independence that we can't do as a devolved parliament, which is perhaps why the support for independence is growing and the support for Joanne Lamont's scaremongering is reducing. Joanne Lamont. I'm not sure at what point arrogance simply becomes delusion, but I think we're pretty close to that point now. The First Minister must think that all Scots heads button up the back, but after independence, at least they'll have zips. This is ludicrous. <laughs> this is a ludicrous defence by a man who used to cry freedom and now gives us a list of wee things that we could do, which we could do, which we could do. sure the brave hearts amongst the SNP imagined that the reason they wanted independence was because of childcare. His list exposes the fact he no longer even defends the concept of independence himself. The First Minister reminds me of Huri Onada, the Japanese soldier who fought on for 30 years after 1945 in the Philippines, refusing to admit the war was over. The war on its currency plan is over, presiding officer, and Alec Salmond has lost it. Now, instead of trying to nail his currency plan to its perch to make it seem alive, will the First Minister just be honest with the people of Scotland? His adviser, John Kay, told him to come up with a plan B. Will he now have the decency to share that plan B with the people of Scotland? <laughs> First Minister. Somewhere in that question, uh, she, Joanne Lambert <coughs> said that things I'd mentioned were we things. Uh, rather like uh, her deputy, who the other night on television said that nuclear weapons was a peripheral issue. Yeah. Does she really believe that the bedroom tax, that transformation of childcare, that abolishing nuclear weapons in this country, that not getting dragged into illegal wars, these are we things? Yeah. Is Order. that the Labour Party's proposition to the people of Scotland, that these are we things or peripheral issues? They are the substance of the independence debate. That's the things that people in Scotland want to control. Now let's take, since I read a long list of the economic levers that would come under our control in an independent Scotland, which are quite substantial things, not we things. Because can I put it this way so that Jan Lambert understands it? The 7% of the taxation of this country we control under this Parliament. Under the much vaunted Scotland Act, that will increase massively to 15%. Under an independent Scotland, we would control 100% of the taxation base of this country. That is independence. Joanne Lambert. Sorry, I expected there might have been something in there that responded to the challenge of the question I was asking. <laughs> This is all displacement activity. Most of the things he mentioned he could do right now. But what he concedes... What he concedes... Order! What he concedes... Order! Is that his vision of independence is to be constrained by a foreign chancellor. That was what the message of yesterday was. Presiding officer, what the First Minister is proposing isn't going to happen. And if it ever did, it could give this Parliament less power in the future than we have now. The First Minister. Come back and listen to what's happening in the real world. But of course, the First Minister's answer is the First Minister's answer is that after a yes vote, after a yes vote, the rest of the United Kingdom will recant. They will U-turn and start agreeing with everything he says. Well, if they're going to go that far, if they're going to go that far, they might as well call themselves Nicola. As Mark Carney left his press conference yesterday, he was reported to say, it's over, it's over. Why won't the First Minister, why won't the First Minister reveal his real plans for a new Scottish currency and admit his plans for a currency union are over. First Minister. Well, Mark, Mark, 
Carney said it yesterday, the conditions in which a monetary union, a sterling area, would work. These were not a surprise given every single one of them was anticipated by this report, the Fiscal Commission Working Group published last year. Now, I noticed in Mark Carney's first page he plays respect to the pioneering work, as he calls it, of great Scottish economists from Adam Smith to Sir James Murleys, who had great influence in the economics profession. That was, I thought, quite a significant reference, because Sir James Murleys is one of the authors of the Fiscal Commission report. Therefore, it is perhaps not surprising that anticipated what requirements you make to make a sterling area work. Uh, now, uh, is Joanne Lamont actually seriously going to maintain that the areas that I mentioned, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the areas over taxation policy of income tax, of corporation tax, of oil and gas taxation, of excise duty, of value-added tax, of air passenger duty, of capital borrowing, these are not peripheral or wee issues. These are the substance of just about every political debate we have had in this Parliament. At the present moment, John Swinney is in discussions with Ian Gray to decide how we might be able, and by going round the legislation, to find a way to mitigate the bedroom tax. Would it not be a lot easier if this Parliament just had the power to abolish the bedroom tax? Capital spending in this country, one of the reasons why our economic performance has been better than the UK as a whole. Would it not just be better if we could decide to increase capital spending in this country over the last few years? And if she actually believes that the oil and gas taxation, the great natural resources of Scotland, are a small, wee or peripheral matter, then she is talking to an electorate who are well aware if we mobilise these natural resources and combine them with the human resources in Scotland, then we can create a society which is both more prosperous and more just. Yes. That is the point and logic of Scottish independence. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. I have no plans in the near future, but... Uh, that uh, Ruth Davidson will take the opportunity to disassociate herself and her party from remarks by a previous Secretary of State for Scotland, circulated by the Conservative Party, arguing that a vote for independence would somehow dishonour the sacrifice of people in the war. Yeah. Now, we are going to have great debates, but can she at least put that ridiculous point outside the yeah. scope of this debate? Ruth Davidson. I am not sure given the campaign that is running in one of Scotland's national newspapers, that the First Minister is in perhaps on the strongest grounds talking about intemperate statements that have been made. So I think the last exchange that we just heard in this chamber had a little bit more heat than light. So I suggest that we all take a bit of a step back as we look at this issue. The First Minister's white paper says that an independent Scotland would have full autonomy over revenue and spending issues. Yesterday, Mark Carney said that an independent Scotland would need to cede national sovereignty. These statements are diametrically opposed. So I'd like to ask the First Minister a very specific question. Who should the people of Scotland believe? Alex Salmond or the bank's governor? First Minister. Clearly, if you enter a money union, you cede control over exchange rate and interest rate policy. Uh, my point to Joanne Lamont was twofold. In the spirit uh, of adding uh, some light, my point is we do not control these things at the present moment, and neither does the Chancellor of the Exchequer, because the Bank of England has been operationally independent and set interest rates over uh, the last 10 years uh, and, and more. Uh, so I think it is right and proper to draw attention to the areas of fiscal policy, the substance of mobilising the natural resources of Scotland. And yes, I do think it is independence to control 100 per cent of your taxation base, as opposed to the 7 per cent we control at the moment. Ms. Davidson. Well, what is being proposed in the White Paper is a Eurozone-style pact, which Mark Carney yesterday specifically said had not worked for Europe, and it would not work for us either. More ceding of sovereignty, more pooling of fiscal resources. Now, that is a two-way street. So the First Minister is expecting 
the spurn spouse to agree to give up their independence over areas of tax and spend too. So can I ask him exactly what powers is the First Minister expecting England, Wales and Northern Ireland to give up to join his currency union? First Minister. Uh, a, 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 currency, a currency union is an agreement to have a currency union so that you can enjoy the benefits which Mark Carney set out in the speech uh, yesterday. I, I, I think there's two reasons why uh, the rest of the United Kingdom will want to join uh, a currency union. Uh, the first is obvious, uh, that Scotland is the second biggest market of the rest of the United, uh, uh, rest of the United Kingdom. And the second one, of course, is that, uh, according to the most recent indications, that 71 per cent of the people of England, Wales, the rest of the United Kingdom, want Scotland to share the pound after Scottish independence. So if that's what the Scottish people want, that's what the English people want, that's what's in the best interest of both countries. That is why I come to the conclusion this is a sensible proposition to put forward. And at the end of the day, let us put it this way, I have got infinitely more confidence in the good judgment of the people of England than I ever will have in the bad judgment of George Osborne. Yeah. The question, Christine Graham. Ooh. Uh, thank you, President Officer. First Minister will be aware that this is the third week of an outbreak of norovirus in the Border General Hospital in my constituency. Is he kept regularly informed of progress in eradicating this, and is he satisfied that all is being done to bring it to a swift conclusion? First Minister. Uh, y yes, I am, and for understandable reasons, uh, the, uh, both the, the Health Secretary and myself keep a, uh, a careful watch on the norovirus outbreak, given the disruption uh, that it causes to, to hospital wards. Over, the, over Scotland as a whole, the norovirus outbreak has been less than it was last year thus far, but the, the member is quite right to, to point to, to the borders where there have been specific and particular difficulties. Overall, the out level of norovirus has been declining in recent years, but she is also right to say it can have a severe and dislocating effect on particular hospitals given the outbreak. And that is why the Health Secretary and myself have this uppermost in mind to continue the, the plans uh, to uh, both deal with the norovirus when it occurs and also continue the plans to try and eliminate that and other hospital acquired infections from our wards. Question number three, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Scottish Government last reviewed the powers of the Office of Judicial Complaints Reviewer. First Minister. Well, the, the Cabinet Secretary, in evidence, I think, to the Public Petitions Committee last year, said that the Government do not see a need for a review of the Office of Judicial Complaints Reviewer at this time. The Judicial Complaints Review has been in office since September 2011. Uh, she has told Mr McCaskill she does not wish to be reappointed. We are grateful for her work to date and her commitment to assist with a smooth handover to her successor. John Wilson. Thank the First Minister for his reply. And like the First Minister, I would also like to highlight the valuable contribution Ms Sally has made in her role, especially the 20 cases identified as breaches by the Judicial Office for Scotland in relation to the judiciary since 2011. Following the decision by Ms Ali not to seek a second term and her comments reported at the weekend, could the powers of the Judicial Complaints Reviewer be enhanced to give the role greater independence, especially when compared to the equivalent powers and budgets in England and Wales and the role of the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Ombudsman? First Minister. Well, uh, let's... Uh put it on the record again, that I am grateful, uh, as the member is, to Ms Ali for her valuable public service over the past two and a half years and the improvements that she has encouraged the judicial complaints process. The judicial complaints reviewer carries out responsibilities independent of both government and judiciary. In her report for 2012-13, the judicial complaints reviewer records having received 43 review requests and inquiries. By comparison, the judicial appointments and conduct ombudsman for England and Wales it received 110 complaints and written inquiries, of which 482 concerned the personal conduct of judicial office holders. And the powers and the budget reflect that difference uh, in the workload. There isn't actually a process of independent review of judicial conduct, conduct complaints in Northern Ireland, but that is the, the, the position uh, as we have it. We are grateful for Ms Ali for her work, and in particular uh, for the commitment she has gave to, to smooth the introduction of her successor. Question number four, Claire Adamson. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government is giving to the Dot Scott process? First Minister. Well, we have actively supported the campaign for the new Dot Scott domain since the proposal was first referred to us by the petitions, uh, Parliament's Petitions Committee in 2008. 
Earlier this week, it was confirmed that DotScot Registry had concluded contractual negotiations with ICANN, and it was apparent that DotScot domains would be available for sale this summer. And we believe that DotScot domain gives individuals and organisations in Scotland and the wider Scottish diaspora an option for clearly expressing uh, their Scottish identity or affinity online. Clear Adams. I thank the First Minister for his, his answer. Uh, I absolutely concur with the opportunities for industry in Scotland, not least of which in the gaming industry, um, um, as they distinguish themselves as Scottish companies. But can I ask the First Minister how the .scot domain could be used to harness um, and engage with the tens of millions of people in the Scottish diaspora? First I think Claire Addison is right to, to point to the, the video games industry, which has particular strength in Scotland, where, where this uh, opportunity will be particularly uh, attractive. But around the world, there are tens uh, of millions of people who not only claim a family connection to Scotland, but many, many more, many more tens of millions who have an affection and affinity for our nation. So now that the new Scottish domain has been confirmed, we have begun further research into the practical applications of how we best use .scot domains. We will be consulting with a number of diaspora organisations uh, as part of that process. And, and can I just add, uh, there have been a number of occasions recently where a process which has been started on this Parliament's Petitions Committee has come to, to fruition. Uh, I think we should all take pride in the, in the work of that committee of this Parliament. Margaret Fraser. Uh, thank you. I am sure we can all agree there will be uh, commercial opportunities for Scottish companies using the .scot domain name. But can the First Minister confirm that uh, there are no plans to replace the existing .uk suffix used by Scottish Government and many public bodies across the country? First Minister. Well, I, I thought for a second we were going to get the same unwavering support as the member gave to the Bannockburn celebrations yeah. before he realised he was out of touch with the rest of, of his party. I would hope that even the Conservative Party should agree that this is an opportunity that the public authorities and government and the people of Scotland should embrace. And if that leaves behind the attitudes of the Conservative benches, I think I know which side the people of Scotland, the companies of Scotland and the public authorities of Scotland will be on. Question number five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the report by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation about the number of families living below the minimum income standard. First Minister. Well, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation found that the percentage of households below minimum income standard in Scotland was 21 per cent in 2011-12, a rise of 3 per cent since 2008-9. The report concluded that in 2011-12 the proportion of families below the standard rose sharply as benefit and tax credit cuts started to kick in. Clearly, it is unacceptable in a country as prosperous as Scotland that a fifth of the population should be living below socially accepted minimum incomes. That is why we need the powers of independence to defend the welfare system, expand childcare and abolish the bedroom tax. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for, her, for his expected response. Um, the JRF report states that the number of families living under the minimum income standard has actually increased by 70,000 over the past five years. Some 82,000 of those families are now under even greater financial strain due to the bedroom tax. We have asked the SNP government for the best part of a year to fully mitigate the bedroom tax. We have now provided evidence of the power that he has to do just that, a fact confirmed by Audit Scotland in relation to Renfrewshire Council's assistance fund. Can the First Minister now tell me whether his government will provide the funds to mitigate the full impact of the bedroom tax. First Minister. I welcome the fact that implicitly Jackie Bailey is acknowledging that control of social security is yeah. fundamental to defeat yeah. inequality in Scotland, which makes her and the Labour Party's position that these powers should be continued to be reserved to Westminster all the more incredible. Now, can I say to, to Jackie Bailey, and I'll say it as gently as possible, that we know that the way to do this, to get money into people's hands, is discretionary housing payments. John Swinney has been meeting Ian Gray and Jackie Bailey to see if there's a measure that we can use legally in order to try and defeat the bedroom tax in Scotland. But every single one of us, and incidentally just about every single person in Scotland, knows that the way to defeat the bedroom tax and the rest of the impositions on the poor and disabled in Scotland is to take the powers over Social Security that Jackie Bailey alone seems to want to continue to have reside at Westminster. Liam MacArthur. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, is the First Minister in favour of people on minimum income uh, paying more tax, or minimum wage paying more tax? And if not, why does his white paper reject proposals put forward by the Liberal Democrats to further raise the income tax threshold to £12,500? The Minister. white paper sets out the policies of the Scottish National Party which will transform the lot of the poor and low paid in Scotland as opposed to the government of which his party so loyally supports which as we have heard has covered and layered sections of Scotland with inequality and poverty and therefore for anybody supporting uh, the Tory Liberal Alliance, who have visited this on the poor of Scotland, requires a brass neck, which is even greater than the Liberals will need in Scotland when they face the people again in the European elections. John Mason. Would the First Minister agree that the statutory minimum wage should be at a higher level that people could actually live on, and that both Labour and Conservative governments at Westminster have failed to achieve this? First Minister. Since well, I hear it's ridiculous. Since the recession of 2008, under both the Labour government and the Tory Liberal Alliance, the minimum wage has failed to keep pace with the cost of living. If the inflation increases had been introduced five years ago, some of the lowest paid Scots would have been earning over £600 a year more. That is why the White Paper indicates that the way forward is to ensure that at least, and perhaps we can all agree on this, that we should ensure by statute that the minimum wage has to keep pace with the cost of living so we won't have a situation ever in the future where the lowest paid bear the brunt of the economic sacrifices that have to be made. Question number six, Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with local authorities regarding the provision of primary school places. First Minister. Well, there's regular discussions with local authorities, COSLA and the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland uh, about a range of issues. It's, of course, a statutory responsibility of each individual local authority to provide an adequate number of school places for children and young people within its area. As a result, however, of action by this Government and this Parliament, we have reduced the illegal primary one class size limit from 30 to 25, which ensures our youngest pupils get more time with their teachers. Liz Smith. Uh, First Minister, parents at the very successful and popular Hillhead Primary School have been told by the local authority that their children might not, after all, be entitled to a place at the school because it is so heavily oversubscribed and that the catchment area might have to be redrawn, a decision which, not surprisingly, is causing a great deal of anger, particularly amongst parents who have moved into that catchment area. Will the First Minister agree that a system of school placement which is based on catchment areas and which is purely supply-driven is not working well enough and that it should be replaced by one which is demand-led, where the money follows the pupil and where parents have maximum choice to decide which school their parents attend? First Minister? No, I, I, I don't agree with that because the, the, the system that uh, is being proposed by the Conservative Party, as indicated in the past and indicated elsewhere, leads to huge chaos and disruption on the school catchment and area place uh, system. The local authority statute responsibility, I've indicated, I'm sure uh, that Glasgow will follow that through. But can I just point out that in the first session of this Parliament, we had a range of debates where a successive number of speakers said that there weren't enough schools being refurbished or, or built. I've heard less of that uh, in recent times, and I now know the reason why, uh, because in uh, the uh, a, a whole period of two terms of, uh, of Labour government, a total of 328 schools were completed or refurbished in Scotland. The total thus far for this SNP government is 463, which I, I've got to say, given the capital constraints we've been working under, well, the Labour Party don't want to talk about this anymore. No wonder, because it indicates the success of the SNP and the failure of the Labour Liberal Alliance. Jenny Mara. The First Minister may be aware that classroom assistants in primary schools in Dundee are being moved um, out of primary schools where they give support to primary one and two and into nursery schools. Can the First Minister commit to make sure that there's going to be no reduction of support in primaries one and two across Scotland? First Minister. I have given the, the figures already in a previous answer in terms of the improvements that are being made in, in primary one uh, and two. But given uh, what we saw in terms of the discussion, let's put it this way, between the EIS uh, and the Labour Party administration in Glasgow reported in the press today, I think Jenny Mara should hesitate, should hesitate 
uh, before she starts uh, attacking individual uh, local uh, authorities. Local authorities have statutory responsibilities. The improvements in terms of the future pupil teacher ratio in primaries one to three are clear and evident to see, as indeed is the vast number and increase in schools which have been built and refurbished the length and breadth of Scotland. Well, I know that Jenny Mara wasn't around, but I can assure Order. her in the last session of this Parliament, her colleagues wanted to attack the SNP Government because, as they saw it, there weren't enough schools being built. Now that the figures demonstrate and show exactly the opposite, apparently it's got nothing to do with this Government. I think it's part of the success of the Schools for Future programme. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move on to members' business. Members, who, we have a point of order. Ken McIntosh. Ask, uh, presenting officer, whether the First Minister would like to clarify something he said in his uh, answer to Lee MacArthur. I believe he said that the White Paper sets out the policies of the Scottish National Party. Could I ask him to clarify, is that a Freudian slip, in which case he can just clarify the record? Or is it a statement of fact, in which case he could refund the Scottish taxpayer for the cost of this document? As Mr McIntosh well knows... Order! Order! As Mr McIntosh well knows, that is not a point of order. And I am not responsible... First Minister? To help uh, Mr McIntosh, I know he wants to reread the white paper carefully. It both sets out the case for an independent Scotland and it goes on to say that the choice of government will be the Scottish people and gives an indication of what the SNP would do if we were lucky enough to be chosen by the Scottish people in an independent Scotland. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.